the point of using the this uh, sort of inspector is to try to figure out what we need to make changes in our design. And honestly, the more we do it as we go on through the class, the more it'll make sense. How many of you on a previous class have used this inspector to kind of dissect your, your project design? Anyone? Raise your hand. A couple people. So it's pretty new for a lot of people. So let me show it to you a little bit more because it is something that's going to be very useful for us. Here's another example. Uh, when I was the first one that I was going to get to. When I click on that on that icon to to pop up, I would like this background color here to be different than this. Technically, for some reason, this is transparent. So I'm seeing this yellow the same as this yellow. And depending on the color, maybe I chose a nice dark blue color here. Well, that color would show through here, and I'd have a blue color on a black color, and that'd be very hard to read. So people often ask as they start to make these designs, well, how do I change the color of this pop-up? Because in Theme Roller, there is nothing here about changing the color of a pop-up. So here's another example where we're going to use this um, inspector. So if you want to follow along with how I'm going to do it, uh, you run your project in, in Chrome, and then open up your, your options pop-up. Once you've got the options pop up open, you want to select the selector right there. And as you hover over the design, you see, OK, well, if I'm putting my mouse over here, that's going to select the main section, and that's going to give me the code about the section. If I hover over options, uh, that's hovering over saying that's an H1. So if I click on it, it'll give me those details. If I then hover over here, this is going to be an H2. and the point is that if you then hover over various things, maybe at a certain point over here, something like in the corner, it says article. If I click on article, I've selected the article, the main design here, article role main. This is an article inside of a div, inside of PG options, inside of the body, inside of HTML. And I see then the cascade of CSS. And it tells you, well, in your jQuery line 3, it had this, but it got crossed out because something else took over. Going back down here. In this other line, it said, well, do this. Set this margin, set this width. Further even back, it's saying, set it like this, set it like that, then set it to transparent or whatever. Oh, look, here's that universal selector that we have on line 1 of index CSS that is applying a transparency. Well, sometimes it does take detective work about, is it this thing that I'm trying to edit, or is it this thing in here? And maybe going back up through the levels of the of this tree here. It started an article. I click the level up. I click the level up. I see some colors here. These are getting crossed out. So what's crossing them out is the thing that's further up on the list somewhere. The this one is takes a little moment to figure out where it is in there. And obviously I have the answer to it, but if you're trying to change this yourself on your own, sometimes I have to say it's not as straightforward or it doesn't make as much sense as it could. And that's that's the way CSS sometimes. CSS is sometimes. I said a while ago, HTML is the easy one. CSS is harder because of how things are interrelated and the cascade and the levels of thing inside of levels. And JavaScript is the hardest one because of it's so interactive, it's so powerful, it can cause so many issues. So somewhere within the this um, cascade of CSS in here, it's in here somewhere. I already know the answer of what it is, but uh, when I find it in a moment, I'll point it out. But this is how we want to change something about, I couldn't find what color to change, so I need to use the selector. Eventually, after finding it, we'll go back to the JavaScript. I mean, we'll go back to the Visual Studio, and um, I'll go look at index CSS. We'll add a new line at the very end. We'll say here, fixing the transparent background of a pop-up. It 
it's UI dot UI dash dialog dash contain then a greater than symbol space dot UI dot content and curly braces so again I already have the answer about how of what we need to edit. I got it from using that selector to find the right piece of what needs to be changed. When, when I'm not giving you the answer, that's what you need to do. You need to sometimes do some trial and error about, OK, I'm going to select this. Is it this piece? Is it this piece? How do I know what it is? Well, you're going to see some example here somewhere, oftentimes about colors or sizes or fonts or something. And then when you're here, you make the change. This change doesn't apply. Uh, this change doesn't get applied permanently. This change is here is, is only while I'm in the inspector. But once I figure out what needs to be changed in the inspector, then I can apply it in Visual Studio. Obviously, I don't want to apply that. That'll look weird. But the idea is that I'm using this selector in the in this uh, element inspector to figure out what I need to edit. And so further what I need to edit, this is what I'm saying here. There is something with a class, because of the dot, UI-dialog contain. That's built into jQuery Mobile. We are not inventing it. Uh, jQuery Mobile invented that and applied it. The greater than, I believe that means a direct uh, child descendant. So it's saying, there is a thing with this class, and it's directly inside of this other thing. These classes, actually this is UI, sorry here, UI dash content, not dot. There's a class that is inside of another class. That's basically what that's saying. Fixing the transparent background of a pop-up. Technically, the element with a class of UI content is a child of the element with the class UI-dialog contain. That's what the code there is saying. So that, that bit of esoteric code there and then that symbol, that's what that's saying. That there's this thing inside of this thing, and then we can further edit it. We want to set the background color. And here's where you can choose any of the colors that are built that are built in. I'm gonna go with a really obvious one. Where did I see it here? Chartreuse. So what this is trying to do is have us edit that background color of pop-ups. jQuery Mobile, through a little bit of inspecting, has the appropriate code that does that. If you save it and run it, You should see your options pop up change to a nice shade of chartreuse, chartreuse, which is what you probably don't want. You want your own color. So I'm going to run this and uh, see if I get that color. Options, chartreuse. So I'm not going to go with chartreuse. That looks way too weird. So any other color that you want here. Remember, you have the full list of color pop-ups here. If you choose a color, let's say black, 
that'll look really nice as a background. Problem is that uh, we have black text on a black background. It looks kind of cool, but hard to read. This is the example of user interface design. So we've talked briefly, and we'll talk more about it, that background-color edits, obviously, the background color of something. How do we edit the text color in CSS? Color, yes. So then here, we're saying set the background color of this pop-up box to black, and therefore set the color of text to white. I think those colors are still too harsh, so you'll figure out your perfect colors. But uh, the idea here is then that now I am styling the pop-up in my own way. It didn't have a nice drag-and-drop interface, unfortunately, in jQuery Mobile. Sometimes then we need to open up the, the inspector, the developer tools, and do a little bit of sleuthing, a little bit of detective work to figure out what thing do we need to edit. And I'll go with gold. Ghost white. And these need semicolons at the end. So we'll be exploring CSS uh, a little bit more as we go on through the, through the class. But here now I'm starting to customize it to be my own styles, my own colors, and so forth. So um, you want to save that, and you'll continue to play with it. Uh, I'm going to go into fonts in a moment, but question, general questions at this point. If it doesn't quite work, we'll, we'll check it in a moment. But general questions about what we've done here? Yes. Uh, I never saw the class UI content in the F12 code. Can you see, like, how do you discover that? It should be in there somewhere. Let me take one more pass through it, because I know it's in there. But that one is one of the ones that's kind of tricky about where exactly is it. Let me just look at it one more time. If I don't get it right away, I will find it during the next break and, and then show the class. But um, just let me try one more time here. So I'm going to open that up. Uh, gold looks terrible, so I'll have to change that. But so the way I would try to find it is I would click anywhere in the in the body there. Um, UI corner, last child, um, CS index CSS. That's the one that I wrote right now. Notice we can turn these on and off to deactivate them. So this is the one I wrote right now, line 48. It's going to be in here somewhere going further to, through the cascade. I think we can then filter it. Um, that is contain. So it is in the block here somewhere. My dialog contain header contain oh there it is okay so um, again the way I found it with the selector I tried to select the background edge that should select the article so once I'm in article there's the basic element there's this la there's this one about content last child then keep going do I dialog contain um, contain header contain content so it's uh, it should be a few entries down from that there is no entry here of color so this is the background color 
so that is the right spot. So that one, uh, I, I did have to explore it a little bit and trial and make trial and error about it, and then presented it to the class. Uh, but I saw two more hands. Uh, was that the same question or two more? Yeah. Um, it might have something so when you're trying to when you're trying to open up this option you get an error like if I try to log in so I can get to the home, the home screen, or the home screen. yeah we might have to look at it during the yeah. break so your your login log out system isn't quite working does your console yeah. tell you anything that might help you out uh, it says that uh, Oh, okay. That that does remind me of something here. That might be a good question. Okay, um, let me mention something here that uh, maybe one or two people asked me about, but it might be useful for the whole class. Um, when you brought in your particular images and maybe even CSS files, sometimes this happens. Let's do this. Let's go back to the index.html file. Let's all go back and check something out here. In the handout, one of the handouts that I gave, remember when I explained all of the lines of the basic template? There was a line in here that I forgot to go into. Uh, there's a line 8 right here, which is our content security policy. This is a line that is allowing and disallowing things to be loaded into our project. So this is, this is saying what is secure for our project to use. Unless it's listed in this content, it will reject it. So it's saying you can connect to a website called GS Static. This is a Google website. You can connect to, an, uh, to, a, to a path of data or gap. But it doesn't mention anything about certain websites or certain files. So this line, 8, is being very... Um, it's it's being too much too secure too too conservative in letting us use all of the possibilities we could as we test our project I want to deactivate that line so that it's not so restrictive so this comment the end of this comment there's a comment that started here, ended here. Let's move that comment, cut it and paste it, or just, I think you can drag it, move that comment right after this content security policy so that it's part of the comment, and therefore it is commented out. It's deactivated for the moment during our testing purposes. I've found that for a lot of people, the that particular line causes too much trouble during testing. So I would recommend to turn it off. One moment. Um, there was a the, that uh, you can check if that worked or not. If it didn't, we'll check you during the break a bit more. Uh, another question over here. I thought I saw Mara, your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might look at it a little bit more one on one on the next break. Question? So by default, we get the A thing from the CSS. Is there a way to make everything um, the B thing? There is a way to set B as the default theme. I would have to look it up back on jQueryMobile.com. But the answer is going to be there on jQueryMobile.com about how to automatically set the, uh, the theme to be B instead of A. So there is a way, but I'd have to look it up. All right, so this is this is if if this color stuff didn't quite work for you, we'll do lab time a little bit later. I'm going to move on now to uh, customizing fonts. At this point, I've customized some of the colors of my project, and there's still more that I can do. And We'll keep exploring it, but for the moment, at least, we're not looking at the boring colors anymore. Now, I don't want to look at these boring fonts anymore. I don't want to look at that plain old Arial or whatever that is. I want to use some more interesting fonts. So uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. I'll show one way, first of all, here. 
So in your web browser, let's go to the website fontsquirrel.com. So fontsquirrel.com. So remember when we had the discussion, uh, the presentation about copyrights? Fonts are a thing that are copyrighted. You need a license to use a font. Even though my computer comes with 200 fonts, when I open up Word, I've got so many fonts to choose from. Technically, the license that everyone agreed to but no one reads when you use Word is that it's saying you're going to use these fonts for a certain purpose. And one of those purposes is not to make an app. It is to use it in a word processor document. It is to make a flyer, to, to do it for your presentation or a research paper. It's not to use our font in your app. So we would need a license to use that cool font in Word in our app. That's going to be very expensive. Fonts can cost literally thousands of dollars for you to license to use in your app. So I don't want to spend a thousand dollars just to use that certain font in my app. Uh, I remember looking this up on a couple of different websites. I, I thought that font costs more than my laptop. So what we can do is if we go to a website that focuses on fonts that have a more liberal policy of licensing, then we'll be safer. That's what Font Squirrel is 100% free for commercial use. Because there may be plenty of websites out there that say 1,001 free fonts. But then the license says for use in posters, or as a flyer, or as a you know, term paper, but not as a commercial product. If you're making money off of your app, you owe us money for using our font. Not at Font Squirrel. The purpose that they've got here is 100% free fonts for commercial use. It doesn't have 10,000 fonts to choose from. It's not like doing a regular Google search where you will get 2 million results in 0 0.7 seconds. It has a lot less fonts than that, but there's a lot of different styles. And the main important thing is that it's safe for you to use in your projects. Notice the icons right here. Cuesta, this font, is safe to use on, what are the icons, on a desktop computer. You can use it on a website, but on this one you cannot use it in apps. Fira Sans can be used on those plus in apps, ebooks, PDFs, and then apps. So at a glance, I see very cool. This one I can use in my app, this one I can't. Now, obviously, I'm not going to tell on you that you used a font that you weren't supposed to, and nothing will really sort of like detect that you use the font wrong. But if you get caught, it could be the repercussions. Remember the presenter said, you may go years without any problem, and suddenly you get a letter, and then you've got damages, which means you owe someone money. So it's just going to be better for you to do it right the, right the first time. I think he gave the example about you get hired for a company, you borrow a font that you found online, and then eventually you get found out, and you're in trouble, and your client is in trouble, and then you don't get hired anymore. So the way we'll use this site, uh, we're going to browse it a little bit. And um, let's say to, to uh, kind of look at the same thing. On the right side, they're classified also. There's some casual fonts, retro fonts, etc. It's just so that we all look at the same thing. Click on retro, find fonts retro on the right side. There's these different ones, Airstream, Anagram, Becker, etc. BP Script is one that could be used in our app, but just want to look at one over here. For example, Airstream. Um, on any of these, you can click on the name of it. Don't click Download yet. Click the name of the font. Airstream. You get a nice big preview of it, sample some info, get specimens, 
So all of the letters alphabet uh, of the alphabet and numbers, uppercase, lowercase, you get a sentence with those fonts. What's cool about this is then you see that you'll get some fonts that look great when they're nice and big and terrible when they're that small. That is not very good at all for read readability. <clears throat> as, as, a, as a P tag, that looks amazing as an H1 tag, H2 tag, not as a P tag. I can give it a test drive by then going to there and typing in some text and then it'll preview what it's going to look like. Well, now I'm not liking it that because that C looks like an L. My app is not LBDB, it's CBDB. And that B is looking like a G to me or an F or something. So test driving it before using it in our projects. The glyphs are all of the letters included. So this is cool here. We get a the, a little the when we try to use at symbol. That might be good or bad. I actually want to use the at symbol and it, it becomes a the. But I do want to use a the, and I've got it there. So you've got some of the various other language letters, greater than symbols, license, basically. What you may or may not do, you may not adapt it, you may not reverse engineer it, decompile it. The font is not open source, but they're giving you the ability to use it to embed it into your projects. And then you may see web font kit. So here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to um, we're going to pick a font, and maybe just so that it looks the same for all of us so that we understand how it works, uh, I'd like you to pick the Airstream font. It's, we'll, we'll be able to change it to something else, but just so that we can... Um, actually, let me just confirm something. Okay, yeah, that'll work. So. I found this under the retro font, so on the right side, let's go to retro. Click on the name of the font. Don't click on the download, we don't want that, we want something else. Click on Airstream, the actual name of the font. Not every font has this, but if your font has a tab that says Web Font Kit, that's what we want. Web Font Kit, if you click there, this is, this is going to give us a zip file with a bundle of things. Most importantly, the code of how we apply this font to our project. If we simply were to click download, it'll give us the font, but then no explanation of how to add it to our project. Whenever any of these fonts has a web font kit, this has the instructions of how to apply it. So if you don't see a web font kit, skip it for the moment, then I'll show you how to work with it if it doesn't have a kit. Well, from this screen, then, it says this font's license appears to allow you to use at font face CSS for embedding. If it doesn't have a web font kit, we'll skip that for a moment. Here, choose the type of font. There's these four possibilities. Which one do we pick? Well, the default is the best one. That's the one that's recommended. It works on all modern browsers on all devices. I've taught this class for five years, and I've seen the evolution of this, that in the old days, we'd have to select all of these versions of the font for it to be most compatible with every device. Now, as these devices get more advanced and such, and smarter, it seems that we just have one font to rule them all. You don't need every other kind of font to be compatible. So this WAF file is the one we want. That's the one that's checked on. And you should have then a download button. Click to download that font face kit. I'm in Firefox this time. It popped up open or save. You want to save this and save the zip file to your USB drive. Not into the project folder, just somewhere in the USB drive. And then extract the zip file. So after you save it, then you want to right-click it to extract.
I copy the zip file into my flash drive and then I'm going to right click the zip file to extract all. The font face kit zip file has instructions how to use it. If you were simply to download the TTF or OTF file, there'd be no instructions. If you open that HTML file, it'll then tell you, okay, how to use it. You want to add your font to your project, and then in your CSS file, you want to include the code that points to the file. Now, unfortunately, this code is generic code. It uh, will have a more specific one in a moment. And then in the index, or in the index file, you can then link to the CSS file. So these instructions in general, also it has like some troubleshooting. Why doesn't it work? You can read that on your own. But um, inside the web fonts folder is my particular font, which is Airstream. Inside of that particular folder, you've got two files. Uh, the actual font file, in my case WOF, W-O-F-F, -F, and a style sheet file with further detailed instructions on how to apply it into our project. So what we need to do is copy the WAF file into our into our project folder um, into the CSS folder so your particular font drag it into the CSS folder in Visual Studio just the C, just the WAF file the font file the WOF file you probably have to extract the zip file. If it doesn't let you drag it right away, you need to extract the zip file. Question? For the purposes of just learning how to do this, yeah, technically the license doesn't say, doesn't allow to use it in an app. You're right, see how it's not uh, dark here? So technically we can't use it in our app. For learning purposes and testing purposes, it's okay. But when we do this for the assessment, which I'll bring it up again later, you do need to use a font that is okay on devices. All right, so um, I've copied the I've copied the WAF file into Visual Studio. It's in my CSS folder. It's in the same folder as my index.css. Index.css is our custom CSS file. Remember, in the order of things in the HTML file, we're saying load up the basic jQuery, load up my colors of the style, and then load up the custom CSS. So the basic boring font gets loaded up of jQuery first. We never change the basic boring font, so then it got used again. And then we're going to write our own custom font in the index.css file based on that font we just downloaded. So if you open up index.css, it should already be open. What we're going to write in here is going to depend on the font that you downloaded. Now, if you downloaded the Airstream font like me, it'll be exactly what I'm going to type. But when you download your own font, it'll be a little different. And the exact code that you need is in that example stylesheet CSS file. I'm going to open up here, right click. I'm going to open it up in good old Notepad++, or brackets if you want. I want to take a quick look inside of the CSS file to get the code to copy and paste it into Visual Studio. You can open it in Visual Studio also if you want, but we want to open the CSS file, we want to edit the CSS file, that is not open, we want to edit it, because that has the particular code of your font. So when you choose a different font besides Airstream, notice what this says. We have the CSS command, the CSS, this um, at font face. We're basically seeing here, let's activate a font. We're going to use a font family called Airstream Regular. So this is the, this is the uniqueness about you. My particular font that, that, I, that I downloaded was Airstream. So that says there. If you downloaded something else like Chiller, it would be Chiller in there. It's then saying the source of that font is this EOT file, which we didn't download, we don't need. We'll remove that line in a moment. 
and WAF, WAF2 TTF SVG. So this still has like all of the code, the verbose code about the TTF version, the EOT version, the SVG version. We need to copy this whole line, this whole chunk. Don't forget the final curly brace there. It's all the way two lines at, at the end, but don't forget to copy that as well. I'm copying it out of Notepad++. I'm going back to Visual Studio, and then inside of our CSS file. Now, we've got the universal selector, which applies to everything. Then we've got the body. And then this media query. I'm going to paste it into line 19. So after the body, load up the basic aspects of body, and then load up our particular font. So we're saying we're going to activate the Airstream regular font. And Airstream regular comes from this file. We only, we only, needed, we, we only got the WOFF file. So we don't need the line that says, oh, connect to the EOT file. So we don't need that. There's a part here that says, OK, load up the EOT version. We don't need that. There's a comma right there. Load up the WAF2. We don't, we don't need that. We don't have that file. So delete that. Then it says, load the, the web font dot waf. Well, that's exactly what we have there. So we do need that. We'll leave that. And basically, what's after that we don't need until that semicolon. Activate a custom font. Requires the WAF file in the CSS folder and the following code modified. Based on your font. This activates the use. This gives us the ability to use the font. It doesn't actually apply it to anything. <clears throat> to actually apply it, then we say something like, to every heading 1, we're going to set the font family to the name of the font, which is right here. In quotes, Airstream regular, lowercase, no spaces. Quotes Airstream regular semicolon. Then apply the font to the following element. So to activate a custom font, we need the file in our project. Then we need the code there at font face, which connects to the file, basically. Then we need to apply it as necessary. Here, I've applied it to anything that is in H1. So at the top of all of my screens, I haven't um, compiled it yet. 
but at the top of every one of my screens, remember, I've got I've got an H1 at the top. So this is saying whether, wherever there's an H1, apply this font. If I run that, and I, I now have the font applied. It's a little small, we can change that of course. But up on H1, it applied it. This text over here might look nice if it's consistent. It might be nice and consistent if I also have this font applying. That's an H2. Down on the footer, maybe I want that font applied in the footer too. That's in H4. So one trick here is if I, if I want to apply some CSS to more than one thing. So don't write this, but here's the long way to do it. I would write, you know, H2, H3, apply this to all of these. Don't write this. This is a long way. The short way is to have H1, comma h2 comma h3 comma h4 comma now i'm saying apply the following to all of these at once wherever any of these four headings exists apply the following this font family If I then compile that, everywhere where any of those headings appeared should have that new font. It's relatively easy, as I showed here, to apply it to all of that. But where it gets messy is some of these fonts are a little too small. Some of them are too big. So this that I, that I did about changing the size of, I mean changing the font of all of these at once worked there. But if I wanted to then you know, change the, the font size, let's say, don't write this, but let's say 99. I'm going to make it really big. Well, the problem there is it's going to apply that size to all four of those headings, which I probably don't want. So this would be a case then where I would then perhaps write h2, then font size 99. So don't write that either, but here is the case. I'm saying all of these headings will get this font. Then anything that is in h2 gets this font size. It's a very powerful concept. Again, CSS, the complexity of it. First apply everything here, line 32. You apply it all universally. Then line 36. However, change, it, change this one unique instance. Unfortunately, to further throw in the wrinkle, that might not work quite away directly here because of jQuery Mobile, of the, of the library, of the framework that we've got in play, Yes, I was just choosing any random value, but yes, we would still use M's, and it comes from this original one here. We're saying in the body, set it to these M's. So picking 99 pixels was just a random number, but yes, I would continue to use M's. Now, the, the issue here then about the sizes of the fonts, it's not simply 
of the headings. That is, it's not simply the heading here of what um, what we need to edit because it's jQuery Mobile. It's actually dot UI dash header space UI dash title. say here then specify header uh, titles in a header and here's where I got what I have the font size and depending on the font maybe 2m might be too big too small this is where you then test it Make sure here there's no space. I mean, there is a space. There is a space between UI header and UI title. that my title all of the all of the H's get that font but then the title up here gets bigger now the other space that's there as well that's more that I would need to edit uh, more CSS but the idea is that I could then target the different side uh, the different aspects of the project Okay, so uh, we added one font here. Let's uh, take one more break just to confirm that it's all working. And then uh, right after the break, there is a mini, there will be a mini in-class assessment. So it's 8, 15-ish. Um, we'll come back at 8, uh, 25. Make sure your code works here. And then we'll come back and do that.